Welcome everyone to June's research seminar series 2021. Uh, our speakers today will be uh, Professor Ruth Horn presenting on the ethics of genomic medicine, redefining the values and norms of, in the UK and France. And secondly, we'll have Professor Sanjay Sisodia using the power of 100,000 genomes project for the benefit of people with epilepsy. Before we kick off with the talks, I just wanted to go through a few items um, that may be of interest to all of you. So um, these research um, projects have been possible thanks to the 100,000 Genomes Project, and uh, that this data is available to any uh, academic researchers that is inter interested in joining, and that can be done via the Genomics England website. Um, we will help facilitate your institution joining the GSIP if they have not done so already. And there's also a pathway for researchers in the biotech industry that can apply via the Discovery Forum. Um, if anyone is interested in presenting their research at a future seminar, please get in touch with us at gsiphelp at genomicsengland.co.uk. Um, we have a number of great uh, research um, seminars lined up in the autumn and we encourage more applicants to um, submit their interest. For September, after we take a break over the summer, we will have Dr. Sunaina Best presenting on molecular diagnoses in the congenital malformations caused by ciliopathies cohort of the 100,000 Genomes Project, and Dr. Melanie Chan doing large-scale whole, whole genome sequencing uh, reveals genetic architecture of the posterior urethral valves and implicates two novel genetic loci. Um, you can find out about all of our um, upcoming publications uh, as we post them on our Twitter at GSIP team. Uh, some other elements that we'd like to um, point out to you is the research portal is, displays all ongoing research projects that um, GSIP and Discovery Forum uh, groups are working on, uh, and they are all available with lay summaries. We update our uh, Twitter regularly with any events and publications and news that are, is generally relevant to GSIP. We have all of these videos available on our YouTube channel and this one is currently being recorded and will be available afterwards. And finally, our CEO, Chris Wigley, uh, has, a G -word, uh, has a podcast called The G Word where they talk about all things genomics. So without further ado, uh, Ruth, would you like to begin presenting? Yes, hello. I will just try to share my screen. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to present at the Genomics England Research Seminar Series. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. And um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so today, as you mentioned already, I would like to present a paper entitled The Ethics of Genomic Medicine, Redefining Values and Norms in the UK and France. This paper has been co-authored together with my colleague Marie Guy, who works at the CNRS in France, and the UK France Genetics and Ethics Network, the UK France Gene Consortium. And before I start my presentation, I would like to say a few words about the development of our network, which goes back to 2018, when I read the announcement of the UK and French governments that they would want to strengthen the cooperation between Genomics England and the analog French strategy, the Plan France Médecine Genomique 2025, in order to lead the world in genomic medicine and to develop common approaches to implement genomics into routine clinical care. And I thought that in order for this to happen in the best possible way, we also need to develop common approaches to ethical standards in research and practice. And this requires I think a good understanding of existing debates, regulations and practices and of the underlying norms and value systems in each country. So I contacted my friend and colleague Marie Guy in Paris to see if she would be interested in building a network for academics, policymakers and other stakeholders who are interested in the ethical issues arising from the implementation of genomics into clinical care. And together with the support from Mike Parker at the Ethos Center, we convened a steering committee with whom we met for the first time in Paris in autumn 2018. And the other members of our committee, besides Marie Guy, um, Mark, Mike Parker and myself, are Mark Bale from Genomics England, and Hervé Schneeweiss and Anne Cambon thompson from the CNRS and INSERM, who both are involved in the French plan 
and Jennifer Merchant, a lawyer and political scientist at the University Paris II. So at this first um, kickoff meeting, we decided that we will run a first um, a, a two day workshop in 2019, which we held at the Big Data Institute in Oxford. We received um, a grant from the Big Data Institute, um, as well as from the French Embassy um, in London. We further received um, financial support from the Welcome Center for Ethics and Humanities in Oxford. Sphere, the center where Marie works in Paris, um, the CNRS, and from the Maison Française d'Oxford. At this first uh, workshop, our aim was to get a broad overview of the state of the art in genomic medicine in the UK and France. And when I talk now about the UK, um, I have to say that we mainly focus so far, we have been focusing mainly on England rather than the UK, but we didn't want to close down things at this stage. And um, so in the future, we may integrate further um, other parts of the UK. So the aim was to identify similarities and differences and particular con topics of concern in each country. And we invited a broad range of speakers from policy, ethics, political sciences, sociology, law, economy, and clinical genetics from both countries. At the end of the two days, um, a few of us decided to write up our discussions and um, we received about 16, we received 16 workshop, um, uh, 16 short paragraphs from our workshop participants, which Marie and I then incorporated into a paper, which wasn't an easy task with uh, 18 authors all together. And um, we were very happy that we could publish this um, paper or, or position statement in the European Journal of Human Genetics, um, which was uh, published later um, at the end of last year. The outline of our paper, as well as of my presentation, the presentation today includes a short description of the two national strategies, Genomics England and the Plan France Médecine Genomique 2025, short PFMG. We highlight the impact of the implementation of genomics on various kinds of relationships, such as that between research and clinical care, patients and health professionals, and between the public and science. And we highlight the impact of um, genomics on guidelines and laws, in particular to pri with regard to privacy and data protection issues. We examine how the implementation of genomic medicine raises questions about trust and solidarity and more broadly about the social contract. And we discuss the value of genomics with regard to its cost benefits analysis as well as its social value. So to start with very briefly some um, very broad overview um, over the two national strategies, Genomics England, as most of you will know, um, launched the 100,000 Genome Project in 2012, which was completed in 2018 through 13 NHS genomic medicine centers across England. Genomics England is a private company, company, but wholly owned by the UK's Department of Health and Social Care. It was set up as a hybrid model between research and clinical care, meaning that it is it has been offering both participating uh, participation and research and potential clinical diagnosis for participants. And um, the 100,000 Genome Project adopted an open-ended consent approach that where participants could decide whether they wanted to receive clinically actionable secondary findings or not, and according to a predetermined list of variants. And since 2021, this year now, NHS Genomic Medicine Services provide access to genetic and genomic testing across England through the public health sector. In France, the aim of the uh, French plan, the Plan France Médecine Genomique, was um, first to catch up with the UK in terms of developing um, uh, genomic uh, medicine and to sequence, and for this reason, to sequence 235 genomes per year between 2020 and 2025 uh, through a network of 12 sequencing services across the country of which two are set up to date. At the moment, uh, there are no specific consent forms for the French plan yet. It is in preparation or under discussion. And currently, genomic testing in France is regulated by the bioethics law, 
which distinguishes between the clinical context and research setting. And clinic consent for testing can be um, uh, given only for specific conditions, uh, for example, for diagnosis or orientation of treatment or in case of susceptibility or family history. And in research, consent for genomic testing can be given to obtain incidental findings that indicate only a serious genetic disease, but there's no um, definite list um, about what these serious conditions may be. This is decided case by case. In uh, later this year, and this is already currently under discussion, the bioethics law will be revised in France and voted upon. And uh, there are two major changes uh, to be expected. First, um, very likely the new law will um, introduce a change with regard to consent, meaning that genetic testing can then be undertaken even when the person cannot consent or is dead, if the aim is preven prevention or improvement of care for relatives. So we already see, and we will see later, that France um, has adopted a very um, familiar um, or um, an approach um, emphasizing familial interests and the interests of relatives. The second change that may be introduced by the law, the new law, is that healthcare professionals could be allowed to reveal incidental findings. However, a list with additional findings to search for is not envisaged. So the discussions around consent and the scope of genomic testing here demonstrate that um, how new technologies such as genomics initiate a rethinking of existing practices and principles. And existing principles and practices are also challenged by a certain lack of clarity about the nature of sequencing activities as to whether they are research or care. In, in genomics, the boundaries between both areas often seem blurred, which raises ethical questions for researchers and clinicians, such as how should clinically relevant findings that were generated during research be managed and who should manage these and who should be responsible for this. And hence the responsibilities for researchers and clinicians, but also for participants, research participants and patients need to be redefined specifically with regard to the communication and sharing of genomic information and the extent to which family members ought to be involved and informed about possibly relevant information. The 100,000 Genome Project has attempted to address these issues by imposing some ethical boundaries um, on sequencing and research. For example, access to whole genome sequencing to aid their clinical diagnosis or treatment required patients to consent to their DNA samples being used in research and also gave them an opportunity to consent to receiving a prescribed limited list of health-related additional findings. In France to date, the issue of communicating additional findings in research and in clinical care remains unsettled, but very likely will be decided upon later this year. Another example where we identified um, the impact of genomics on relationships concerns the relationship between patients and healthcare professionals. As genomics enters more areas of clinical medicine, it raises questions about professional duties towards their patients, such as whether there's a duty to recontact patients, sequencing results is available. And another question concerns the duties to inform the broader family of relevant genomic information. And both England and France have addressed these issues by balancing collective and family responsibilities against individual rights. However, they have done this in different ways. In France, we see that there's a more family or collective oriented approach. That means that in France, patients are required. And if they do not want to do this, the doctor is required to communicate relevant information to relatives. In England, since recently, healthcare professionals now are also required to weigh the interests of relatives in the balance with the interests of maintaining the confidentiality of one person. But we see that in England, we started from a far more indivi individually um, focused approach. And so both countries consider now the broader collective, familial and societal aspects of genomics, but they do this differently, coming from a different tradition. 
The increasing use of genomics in clinical care and the complexity and challenges raised by the technologies to assess genomics have led to concerns about public understanding and acceptance of genetics and genomics. And both Genomics England and the French Plan emphasize the importance of public engagement. The French Plan, for example, has charged the National Institute for Health and Medical Research, the INSERM, to work out a strategy on how to inform and involve the civil society. And Genomics England has made patient and public involvement a very essential part and aspect of its strategy to implement genomic medicine. However, in each country, there are questions that need to be addressed, important questions such as who actually is the real public who should be addressed, and how can it be addressed, and how can we avoid targeting only very specific groups. And the other question is how can a real exchange be encouraged and a one-way education down from experts to the lay public be avoided. Another important topic of discussion during our workshop concerned privacy and data sharing. And as most of you will know, since the launch of the Human Genome Project in, 2009, uh, in, 20, in 1990, genomic research has been a pioneering field in the development of data sharing practices and policies. The GDPR and its national adaptations, such as the data, UK Data Protection Act and the French Bioethics Law, um, they demonstrate that it may be appropriate to share genomic and health-related data that is potentially re-identifiable with certain authorities and institutions. It has also been acknowledged now that individuals are entitled to receive their personal data provided to a controller, for example, a research organization or a hospital, and to transmit those data to another data controller, which is usually called, or which is referred to as the right to data portability. However, data sharing in genomics, as well as in other scientific fields, raises practical and ethical issues since sharing practices may compromise data security. And to address this issue, Genomics England, for example, has set up the research library model, which means that de-identified genomic and other associated health data are stored in the National Genomic Research Library and under very specific conditions, they can be securely accessed by researchers via a trusted research environment. In the French plan, data sharing practices are also valued in principle, and they will be discussed as part of the next strategy phase once data will be produced. And currently, and possibly also in the future, commercially, any commercial use of genetic data is prohibited in France. So we see that limiting privacy protection in both the UK and France are justified, but only when individual rights are outbalanced by collective benefits and a commitment to the common good. And the commitment to the common good also is the basis of solidarity and of both healthcare systems in France and England, which are solidaristic healthcare systems. And solidarity underpins the social contract between the healthcare systems and members of society. And at least in these two national contexts, solidarity is also what provides the basis for public trust. Partnerships, however, between public actors such as governments and hospitals and commercial actors, profit-driven or profit-oriented commercial actors, they can challenge the commitment to the common good as well as the public trust. And we have seen this in an example recently with regard to the NHS data sharing plans that caused um, a lot of um, discussion and um, concern about privacy issues. However, the, um, these kind of partnerships between public actors and commercial actors may not be um, possible to be avoided altogether because the nature and the value of health data economically, technically, and scientifically are so that they make it very important or very interesting for public actors to share the data with um, private profit-driven companies because these companies are those who drive the development of new technologies such as digital health devices or AI um, applications in healthcare. And also both Genomics England and the PFMG, they have stated that they aim to use genomics 
in order to grow new industries, forge collaborations between the public and private sector. So now, if we say that these partnerships cannot be avoided, how can we build trustworthy public private sector partnerships that preserve the solidaristic character and hence the trust into these practices. And we say that these partnerships need to serve and they need to show that they serve collective interests, for example, by securing preferential access to goods and services for public actors first, and to provide health benefits and, for example, monitoring data access such as this is the case in the Genomics England Research Library model. Trust in genomics also requires trust in the value of the technology. And usually when a new healthcare intervention is integrated into clinical practice, careful cost-benefit analysis are undertaken to determine its value, that means to weigh its health benefits against the costs. Currently, genomic testing is entering clinical practice in the UK and in France without this evidence. A systematic review reported that the current evidence base of, on the cost effectiveness of genome sequencing is insufficient to support the widespread use of these tests in clinical practice compared to other technologies that are introduced. And although it is often stated that genomic data provides wider benefits for national economies, there's, there are no studies to date that have evaluated this broader economic value. So if we want to promote public trust and the support of genomics among the public, then the value of genomic data for science, the public health and economy must be very carefully examined. And we need further thorough studies that ensure that resources are allocated fairly and to the benefit of the common good. To date, these studies are very thin. There's very little discussion around the cost effectiveness in, of genomics. Generally, there is something in the UK, but these issues are very little and if not, not at all discussed in France at the moment. As we have seen genomics challenges broadly accepted individual focus principles such as valid consent or privacy. And genomics requires these individually um, focused principles also to be redefined in the light of and rebalanced with co collective values and benefits. And against this background, some bioethicists and policy makers have begun to discuss the need to rethink the social contract between medicine and science and society away from an exclusively individual um, focused solution. Under social contract, we understand a set of formal and informal norms and rules that lay out expectations of the rights and duties of citizens. And for example, in England, we see that where we have a country with a stronger tradition to promote individual interests, and where individual interests such as confidentiality and privacy remain paramount. However, things start um, to shift. As an example, we have seen the Genomics England Research Library model or the recognition of the rights of the family with regard to genomic information. So we share more collectively um, individual data. There have also been calls in England for a new social contract for genomic medicine and a greater focus on the collective dimensions of genomics such as the importance of community participation, public interest and trust, which has been emphasized in the Chief Medical Officer report in 2017. And Genomics England has also called upon the public civic duty to participate in the 100,000 Genome Project as a contribution to the common good and an expression of solidarity. In France, on the other hand, we have a country that starts possibly from a tradition um, that is more oriented towards collective interests. And here we see that there's a high value placed on familial interests that go beyond those of the individual, such as the familial access to genomic information. However, we see that current policy debates and legal regulations take into account the individual rights and also try to balance and integrate them further into their policies. So these are just some indications of how each country has begun to negotiate and redefine collective and individual responsibilities and rights in the context of genomics. I hope to have offered a first overview of some of the, and I know a very broad and um, 
superficial, possibly over first overview of some of the ethical issues raised by the UK and French national strategies. And our comparison allowed us to make three key observations so far. First, the two countries we have seen face similar ethical issues, for example, with regard to the blurred boundaries between research and clinical care, with regard to securing valid consent in the context of complex genomic information. And this, these similarities, even though both national strategies are not yet at the same stage of implementation. Second observation we made is that each country tries to solve these issues by balancing individual and collective interests differently. We have seen the different approaches to consent models, confidentiality and privacy regulations, family rights and public-private partnerships. And third, we have seen that the concept of the social contract could present a useful tool to analyze the ways the UK and France address the ethical challenges genomics raises with regard to the balance between collective duties and individual focused principles. So altogether, we um, have seen that there are similarities, but there are also significant differences between the two countries. And this is where our network, UK France Gene, thinks that wants to come in and um, thinks that in order to promote, promote exchange and collaborative research, we really need to unpack and understand those differences and similarities, understand where they come from, where they, what the underlying value systems are. And this will then hopefully help to feed in and inform the development of joint ethical standards in research and practice. And to conclude, I would like to thank you for your attention, but first, uh, in particular, I would like to um, encourage you to please get in touch if you're interested in our network. We are very open for further ideas for workshops. Um, we are planning um, another workshop later this year. Um, we are very interested in collaborations and new members, also collaboration with maybe other countries um, that could be of interest for our comparison. So thank you. I will start. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, thank you for a, a cracking talk. I'm afraid I missed the beginning because I was zoomed out of this for some reason, but uh, I, I uh, liked a lot of what you said. So thank you very much for doing that on behalf of us all. We've got a few questions. Um, I've got one and then uh, Nina Hallowell's got one. Perhaps we start with Nina's. Uh, Nina's asked, do you really think, Ruth, that the emphasis on the collective in the UK is anything more than the authors of the CMO's reports wishes? In other words, is there really any evidence that the UK, in the UK, the citizenry is really interested in the social contract model? Um, let's say I'm not, well, yes, I think, and we question this in our paper. I think this is so far, this is a statement made on paper. Mm. Um, however, I believe that it is an important sign sent um, in a country where there's a very strong individual, uh, like a focus on usually individual rights. Um, but obviously we need to further um, observe how things are developed, how policies are implemented and how this plays out in practice. But yeah. in our paper, I think we, we want to remain critical about this aspect. And obviously we know that this, what is written on paper is not necessarily what will happen in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, are you, have you had a chance to look at the work that was done with Ipsos Mori following the CMO's report um, emanating from a genomic conversation, and in particular, uh, a focus with work that Ipsos Mori did with uh, public and patients in focus groups around the NHS social contract. Um, uh, I, I, I'm aware that some people have not seen it, but can I just ask you, uh, have you seen that? Because it seems to me there's something in there that says people recognize some of the things they should do as citizens under the NHS social contract in terms of uh, reciprocity, uh, solidarity, solidarity and altruism. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Maybe, maybe you haven't seen that piece of work, but um, it, I'd be keen to get your thoughts. I have seen this piece of work and um, I think I think it is difficult to um, 
use this piece of work as sole um, um, experience or expression of what's going on in practice because it also all depends on how questions are asked and how these uh, focus group discussions are led. So if you ask people in a way that they feel that it, it all depends on how I think you ask questions and how strongly people feel about what they want to share with others. But I, um, I think people realize that there needs to be a shift from very individual focus principles onto more collective interests in genomics because yeah, genomic finding is not only relevant to one yeah. region, but yeah, absolutely. The Angeliki uh, Karasidu has asked, uh, given the spare evidence of the value of genomics as a clinical tool, what, in your opinion, is driving this great focus on genomic medicine in both countries? That's a very good question, a very tricky one. Um, I think, I think I would say there is a big excitement about new. Um, technological developments and about the potential um, use of these um, developments. There is obviously a lot of money going in, I guess, a lot of um, um, economic interests as well. Um, and there is this, I, I don't know, it feels like there is this excitement about uh, changing the approach to medicine um, that has been adopted so far and to bring in something very new to medicine. Um, I think that's and there right. is possibly this big hope that this will make a major contribution and change um, the way how things are done at the moment and how um, um, how treatment can be delivered to mm. patients. But I think there's a lot of, I don't know, it feels like there's a lot of excitement and as a few studies, very few studies have pointed out this at the moment, not really enough evidence um, to give such a strong um, focus and to implement this uh, new technology, mm. spending right. so much money to, to really implement it at this point. So I think it is really important to, to do further cost benefit analysis and to look into these things. And I, I only know like of a group in Oxford of, um, one of one of the representatives were in our workshop group as well, and they do um, some work around the cost benefit analysis. So I've got another question for you from uh, Obed Brew. You make a good point about data sharing between public and private organizations to enhance trust and facilitate progressive development. But your presentation was more weighted in favor of public organizations sharing with private organizations. Please explain briefly what mechanism you propose to ensure information is reciprocal. Um, could you please, um, do you mean uh, reciprocal sharing from public, from private um, yes. institutions? With so, so not a one-way street, I guess, Ruth, is uh, Obed's point here. Yeah. In other words, it's typically public entities giving to private. What do we get back? Well, at this point, with regard, uh, well, reciprocity, reciprocity in terms of data, why we focused on um, the trust because we wanted to, 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 to work on the public trust. So that's why yeah. we focused on, on how we can ensure public trust in the public actors. So what, what needs to be done by public actors to, before they give away their data. Um, in terms of reciprocity, as I mentioned, there um, is, I mean, often or like in the past, there were a few examples where private companies got free data, like a free access to health data, which is high valuable for these companies. Uh, in order to develop uh, develop algorithms. So I think there's a lot going into um, profit-driven companies, even if there's no money, um, like money um, traveling between those. Um, and then in terms of reciprocity, what the public actor should get back is actually possibly, as we suggested, uh, preferential access to health applications if there's an outcome in terms of um, AI applications yeah. or other health devices. Yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, in the Ipsos Mori work, um, the public and patients were pretty unanimous that if uh, they recognized that commercial entities needed to work on the data to generate new therapies, new diagnostics, and, and that those would come back, but there needed to be a fair return on investment or they were wary about sharing their data. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a tangled uh, uh, position unless we get it right. Mm 
Yeah, and so if, sorry if I may just yeah. add, I, I, I yeah, published a paper on this um, in particular, looking at um, issues on public trust and data sharing together with a colleague, Carrie Sidhu at in Oxford. So we've got Let's another one um, for you from Deepa Krishna Kumar. Uh, can you give us some context or example of when contacting relatives is in the best interest of their health if there was a positive genetic result? And what's the law and rights around this in terms of confidentiality? In uh, the UK context or? In neither UK or France, I think. Um, well, in France, um, as I mentioned, like if, if it is considered relevant in terms of medically, uh, like um, clinically actionable findings, where something um, can be, where some, yeah, where either treatment can be offered or, um, anything can be done for relatives by knowing this, um, by having this information, then in France, the patient or um, the doctor, if the patient doesn't want to, then the doctor needs to, is required by law to uh, inform the relatives of the possibly relevant information. And in England, as we um, know the ABC case, there is now requirement that these collect these interests by the family should be taken into account in the decision making. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree with that. Um, Melanie Tangi wants to ask you, do you know what the level of public engagement in uh, France is by comparison to the UK or England uh, and whether the global population are different in a mind in, the, in a mindset compared to the English one? I do not know where they are at the moment in France. I mean, definitely not as developed as in England because it is much younger. The, the, the yes. It started much um, later, the French strategy. Um, I think they focus more on big um, civil society debates, um, larger debates, whereas I noticed in England, at least in Genomics England, the um, websites are incredibly well um, designed. I think there's a lot of um, educational information. Um, there are a lot of, um, I mean, I think the public and patient involvement um, strategies are very much developed and um, have like in England. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know about um, public opinions and attitudes with regard to genomics. No, no and, and I must confess, nor do I, uh, although I work quite close to genomic, um, I, I don't think we've really discussed in detail their public or patient engagement. The, the, though in, in Genomics England and in UK programs now, uh, really you're not going to be funded at all if you don't have mm. really excellent participant involvement. And we've a 30 strong participant panel who sit in various committees. They decide who has access to their data. They help us set the research agenda and set the strategy. And, and the great thing is that they call us to account um, on what we're doing or not doing. And, and then like the last question, Ruth, uh, just to finish, you know, when you've got a, a quandary about an additional finding that you've made and giving it back, then it's, it's, really, um, it, it's really helpful to be able to have that group of people living with the disease to give a view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, and sorry, just to say with regard to France, I think also the INSERM is currently charged to develop an approach on how to... Um, yeah do the public engagement so i don't think they are at all at the same level or, or stage no no yeah. no no but I mean, I'm, they'll get there um, mm. and we work very well with the french and it's yeah. a good collaboration so ruth i want to thank you for your excellent seminar and answering the questions um I, uh, uh, um there's a, a paper in the chat which may be one of yours actually from somebody uh answering one of the other questions but thank you for an excellent talk and also thank you for uh, grasping the difficult challenge of looking at this in a UK France context. We've got to be outward looking in this. So really excellent work. So thank you very much indeed on behalf of all of us. Thank you very much. Bye. So R Ruth, thanks again. And I'm going to introduce my colleague, Professor Sanjay Sisodaya. Uh, Sanjay is a professor at UCL. Um, he's a world leader in the field of epilepsy genetics. And we've had a particularly strong partnership with Sanjay around work with the Epilepsy Society, which is an important patient facing charity, uh, which has also established excellent facilities that support deeper characterization of patients uh, suffering with epilepsy and can provide um, 
deeper phenotypes that may enable us to get line of sight on diagnoses. So Sanjay, it's a pleasure to see you again, and I hand the floor to you. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you very much, Mark, for that very kind introduction. I'm speaking today actually from the Epilepsy Society. So, and I hope to, um, to show you some of the things that we've been doing here. Um, can you see my slides? Yep. Great, okay. So, uh, oops, sorry, there we go. So thank you very much um, for the kind invitation to speak about what we've been doing um, in the context of the 100,000 Genomes Project using genomics for the benefit of people with epilepsy. So I, I think that the audience is, um, is very mixed today with um, uh, basic scientists and clinicians and others. And I thought it might be helpful just to give a little bit of background about epilepsy. Uh, and I'm sorry if this is all very obvious to many people in the audience. Um, so uh, epilepsy is of course not one condition. It's a group of conditions which share uh, the common feature that people who have this condition have unprovoked seizures. But there are many, many different types of epilepsy. And the more actually that we do genetics, the more we're finding that this is the case, both at the common and the rare variant level. And epilepsy, although is obviously a condition of the brain, that's obviously very well established, we know that actually it involves other organs in different ways. And it's best to think of it, I think, as a complex spectrum where um, any given epilepsy might have a range of different comorbidities. So we have a range of different syndromes, different types of epilepsy, and many of these have been long recognized by clinicians. And I think there's obviously one of the things that clinicians do well is to pick up on patterns um, where one or more, or where a group of people have um, what looks like to be the same condition. And what we're finding now, of course, is that this is being underpinned by a better understanding of the genetics. And the more that we do in this field, in the epilepsies, then the more we're realizing that we have to reclassify and reorganize the epilepsies and this is a rolling process so the international league against epilepsy which is the sort of um, the national the international body uh, really organizing these processes um, has had a number of different classification schemes over the last few years which take into account our growing knowledge about the genetics of the epilepsies and how this informs our understanding of syndromes. And this progress is really rapid and I think it's been surprising to many how quickly um, gene discovery has taken place in the epilepsies, especially in the more rare severe epilepsies. And the other thing that I think we're also finding, although we're only just beginning on this aspect of it, is how much um, of the epilepsies could be informed by genetics. So we focus obviously on the cause, um, but there are many different aspects of this. Susceptibility, uh, treatment response, outcomes, outcomes such as sudden death in epilepsy. Many of these different areas could be informed by a deeper understanding of the underlying genetic um, uh, background and basis. So why is this all important? I guess because it is a common and serious condition. There are probably something like 50 million people across the world who have epilepsy. It has to be said that for most of these people with epilepsy, um, genetics is really at the moment something of a dream. Most people with epilepsy across the world don't even get treatment for their seizures. Um, but I would argue actually that this is maybe something that we should be looking at because I think genetics could actually help people in places where actually resources are more limited. And it's serious because of the increased incidence of comorbidities, because it's associated with psychiatric and psychological morbidity, with higher rates of mortality, and of course, um, greater uses of healthcare resources. So for all of these reasons, it's important that we understand it and that we treat it better. And in particular, something to note about it, of course, is that it can be deadly. So if you look at a group of people with epilepsy of all different sorts, about one in a thousand of those people, um, especially if they have generalized tonic-clonic seizures, um, might have sudden unexpected death related to the epilepsy each year. If you look at specific types of epilepsy, that rate can be significantly increased. And for people with frequent convulsive seizures whose epilepsy is resistant to treatment, that rate could be as great as one in 100 a year or even one in 70 or so a year. 
Against all of this, almost all that we can do currently is simply to try to treat the symptoms, to suppress the seizures. There are very few disease-modifying therapies available in the epilepsies, and only for a very few of the different sorts of epilepsies that exist. So here again, I think there is great scope taking all of these different things into account for significant contribution to come from genomics um, for better management of epilepsy um, and to help people who have the condition. So I think as a summary, I would say this is really a perfect area for genomics. And I think the 100,000 Genomes Project has really catalyzed at least our work in this area. And I think we'll continue to do so um, for many years. So I want to give you some examples of the ways, I suppose, that the epilepsies differ. So we have, these are very simplistic um, diagrams really, but just I suppose to give you some background about what we're talking about. So if we're thinking about types of epilepsy, I think there are three main types that are relevant um, um, for us today. There are those we call generalized epilepsies in which the networks involved in the generation of the seizures are distributed across both cerebral hemispheres and a lot of those cerebral hemispheres. So this is this illustration here. The other big group of the epilepsies are the focal onset epilepsies, where seizures um, arise due to network changes in one hemisphere. They may spread to the other hemisphere, but, but uh, the thinking is, the conceptualization is that they're really related to pathology within one hemisphere, or disease within one hemisphere. And then the other major group where genetic progress has been most dramatic over the recent years are the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. So these are individually rare, but collectively very burdensome, serious epilepsies in which the seizures themselves can contribute to impairment of development, cognition, um, psychomotor development. Um, but in, in some of these, also the underlying genetic cause has itself a direct effect on brain function, maybe also on brain structure independent of the epilepsy. So we call this group overall the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. And for all of these different sorts of epilepsy, we have different sorts of treatments. So of course, anti-seizure drugs that suppress these seizures are the most commonly formed, the commonly used types of treatment. But we also have surgical treatment, for example, resecting a focus if we can find one, vagus nerve stimulation and so on. Other treatments also exist. And of course, for the comorbidities. And it's in this context, I think, that we see that genomics really has a big impact. So when we're thinking about comorbidities in the epilepsies, of course, we can think of genetics being involved in various ways. There could be a genetic factor that contributes both to the epilepsy and the comorbidity. And I think this is uh, typically seen in developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. Or of course, there could be separate genetic factors that might cause the comorbidity and the epilepsy. And here's an example of this. Um, so this is an individual, this is a foot x-ray. That's, um, you might be wondering why a neurologist is showing you an x-ray of a foot. I think this is because this individual who has Ulrich Lundborg disease with compound heterozygous CSTB variants had recurrent um, fractures of his foot. Um, and of course, this happens to people with epilepsy. We put it down to a lack of vitamin D due to various causes, um, a lack of physical exercise and various other um, factors which increase the risk of fractures. But someone noticed that this patient's uh, alkaline phosphatase, one of the enzymes you might expect to be elevated during a fracture, was not elevated. In fact, further investigation identified that he had a separate genetic pathology, a mutation in this gene, ALPL, which leads to adult hypophosphatasia, a form of bone disease. Now, this is a clear example where we've got two genetic causes of two genetic conditions in the same individual, and bone disease could be considered here to be a comorbidity, and you could argue that actually his young uh, manifestation of this condition um, was because of his epilepsy and the treatments and the other consequences of that epilepsy. And I think this is uh, an important example, a single anecdotal example, um, but nevertheless an important example of the fact that we have the opportunity with whole genome sequencing not to stop when we find the first variant, not to just think here's the cause of this person's epilepsy and we can now forget about the rest of the genome. I think that the 100,000 Genomes Project is really a fantastic opportunity to look at these other things because actually in terms of clinical management, these things make a difference. They make a difference to how you counsel and treat um, that person's epilepsy. 
And here's another example of what you might consider to be a genetic comorbidity. So this is a really severe skin reaction to an anti-seizure drug. Um, this could be Stevens-Johnson syndrome, for example, where there's a sloughing of uh, a large percentage of the skin and the mucous membranes, a terrible condition, um, which is associated with significant mortality as well as obviously morbidity. Genetic studies, um, genome-wide association studies have demonstrated that there are genetic risk factors that underlie um, such skin reactions, and you'll be familiar with this as also. But of course, there's no reason why somebody who has a rare epilepsy or any epilepsy that might have a genetic causation might not also have a rare variant that causes their, um, their skin reaction to the drugs that we're using to treat their condition. And I'll show you some examples of the work we've done using the 100,000 Genomes Project in this area. And all of this, of course, links to what we, um, uh, I think, in many fields of medicine are hoping we can develop, which is the, this whole concept of precision medicine, a treatment approach in which we use information about that person's genes and environment and lifestyle to try to improve the overall management. Now, of course, this is something I hope that we've all been doing anyway, but which is now enhanced and enriched by the availability of genetic information. And so we have this sort of typical paradigm where we clinically describe a disease or a syndrome, we find the gene, we identify the sorts of mutations that are responsible and how they might be causing the disease, and then hope to develop a treatment that reverses or counteracts or somehow counterbalances the pathophysiology as a precision treatment. But in the epilepsies, I think we can go beyond this and think about precision treatments, not just for the seizures, but also for the entire um, clinical manifestation. So all of these things are the background against which we've been looking at genetics in the epilepsies. Now, here's an example of this, um, of this process. So um, here's a schematic of um, a protein, an iron channel protein called KCNA2, uh, or KV1.1, actually. This is encoded by the gene KCNA2. Um, and illustrated here are gain of function variants um, in, um, in, in this gene. Uh, here you can see the gain of function in vitro. So here is the normal function of this channel. And here is the gain of function in, in this case due to this particular mutation. Through parallel studies, it was demonstrated that uh, this drug, foraminopyridine, was able to reverse this gain of function. This is the work of Holger Lerscher and colleagues, uh, which is coming out in Science Translational Medicine shortly. So you can see here the effect on the wild type protein, and here you can see the effect on the uh, mutant protein with this significant gain of function reversed by the use of this drug. And here is a schematic representation of a series of individuals who have this gain of function um, um, uh, encephalopathy. This is a really serious but also very rare condition, with probably something like 20 people so far known to be uh, affected by this across the world. And each of these individuals is represented here as P1, P2, and so on. And here you can see that um, we've looked at the effect of exposure to this drug as a precision treatment, reversing the pathophysiology across a range of domains, so seizures, EEG, walking, cognitive abilities. And you can see the individuals who are represented here by the dark green bar showed a marked improvement on exposure to this drug. Those with the lighter green showed a moderate improvement. Those with no color showed no change in these domains. And here's my one patient um, uh, that I see with this condition who actually got worse, his seizures got worse. He was the only one in this series whose seizures got worse on exposure to this drug. This drug is actually a pro-convulsant drug and you'd be absolutely bananas to use it for an individual who didn't have this pathophysiology. But for this pathophysiology, it is a precision treatment. We're exploring the rest of the genetic data in my patient with this condition to see why his seizures might have got worse. We don't yet have an answer, but I think this illustrates a number of things that of course this can be considered a precision treatment. I myself would think that unless we explain this failure, this precision failure in a precise way, then I'm not sure that we can truly call this a precision treatment, although obviously the results are really interesting, I think. But the availability of the remainder of the genome to explore, I think, is one of the strengths of the 100,000 Genomes Project, because you can look further to see why something might not have worked when you think it should have worked. So here's another case from the 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, we submitted, as, as Mark said, um, um, quite a, a number of people with what we've called epilepsy plus. So these are people who have epilepsy plus one of a number of comorbidities. Um, and this was the clinical diagnosis 
with which sample was, uh, was eventually um, selected and submitted to the project. So this gentleman had focal epilepsy of unknown cause, severe intellectual disability and kyphoscoliosis. And that's not really a diagnosis, it's nothing really more than a description. Um, and in fact, if you look back over his notes, you can see that these descriptive terms changed over the years for no good reason. So he's 44, seizure onset was an early age, has always been refractory to treatment, and really serious, he spent most of his second year of life in hospital as a result of recurrent episodes of status. He has a variety of different sorts of seizures, sleep-related seizures, convulsive seizures, episodes of, of uh, serial seizures uh, or status epilepticus. He's tried a lot of anti-epileptic drugs. And although one has been moderately helpful, it's very clear that seizures are still his main problem. And although he has um, significant problems, he's totally dependent for all activities of daily living, his carers and his family still identify seizures as the main problem because that's what precipitates admissions and that's what stops him taking part in activities. <clears throat> so if we could find out what the cause of his epilepsy was and maybe see a precision treatment, then, uh, then I think we could make a significant difference to his quality of life. So sequencing took place and he was found to have a uh, variant in KCNT1. Here's the variant here, which is confirmed in, um, in a, labor a separate laboratory study. Um, and this finding is consistent with the diagnosis of a KCNT1 related developmental and epileptic encephalopathy. Now, actually, this particular variant, so this is the variant here, um, is shown in, in, in schematic form in the protein here. This is the mutated residue. And it's a gain of function variant. So again, you can see here wild type activity in vitro and the significant gain of function caused by this variant. Now, it's interesting because this was one of the first um, uh, uh, developmental epileptic encephalopathies for which a precision treatment um, was um, identified. Um, and this is shown in this um, um, uh, graphic here on the left, on the right hand side of the screen. So this drug, quinidine, was shown to reverse the gain of function. So you can see this here for the different mutations. Here's the, the mutation in, in my patient. Um, and as you increase the concentration of quinidine, you can see that there is a progressive reduction in this gain of function that's caused um, uh, in, in this protein as a result of this mutation. So there have been some anecdotal reports of the use of quinidine in people with this condition, with a few early reports showing dramatic improvements with seizures coming under control and in children who had not learned to speak, speech and language emerging. So the question arises then, of course, should we use this um, for our patient, for my patient with epilepsy? Um, and one of the first things we wanted to just check was that this protein is still expressed at his age. So his, his, his age 40 plus, and this is um, the expression of the protein. And you can see, oh, this, sorry, the expression of the gene, and you can see that it's in, it actually increases and remains high in adult life. There'd be no point, I would argue, in using quinidine unless this was the case. So it's present, or at least very likely to be present, um, in his brain. And we know that there is some experimental evidence showing that for this specific um, um, uh, uh, variant, um, the quinidine can be effective. So the question arises, should we use it for my patient? And this is actually, I think, quite a difficult question. And it really, I think, comes back to um, some of the things we were hearing earlier, but also, you know, the questions of how one implements precision medicine um, in, in real life in people with these conditions. So my patient doesn't have capacity to consent to this. He has um, significant uh, features of autism. He doesn't like being touched. He doesn't like his skin being touched. We're not going to be able to get an ECG. EEG alone is difficult uh, um, uh, enough. Um, he's not going to be able to tell us if he experiences any side effects from the use of this med medication. Um, and so we're in a position where it's actually very difficult to, to decide how to proceed. Um, and the sort of thing I think that, uh, that Mark, you were speaking about earlier on in terms of you know, trying to get um, uh, patient involvement in these processes to decide on the best way forward. At the moment, we haven't started quinidine because I think we just can't um, uh, feel secure and safe enough that, it will, uh, that, that we could do that without compromising his health because we know that quinidine has significant um, cardiotoxic side effects. Here's another example of um, uh, important findings from the 100,000 Genomes Project, another individual um, whose sample was submitted and from whom a genetic diagnosis emerged. Um, this was actually a DEPC5 stop gain variant. 
um, but this has come late in, in, in his epilepsy history. So his seizures started at 11. He had all the best treatments that were available. He came here and had what we think is uh, probably the best uh, imaging you can get for epilepsy. His scan was normal. He had evaluation for surgical treatment. He had intracranial EEG implantation. These are the electrodes on the surface of his brain. He eventually had surgery, had a bit of brain resected, which you can see here. There's a bit of abnormality. I think you can just see this is a bit less brown than it should be compared to, say, to this bit of the brain. And in this area of abnormal brain tissue, there were some autofluorescent neurons, um, which was a, a sort of unique neuropathology in his case, which hadn't really been described before. Eventually, uh, through whole genome sequencing, the cause of his epilepsy was identified. He has a stop gain in DEC5. We know that this typically causes similar, but not the same pathologies. This hadn't been reported before with this particular uh, uh, changes in this gene. It's taken 20 years to get a genetic diagnosis. And this genetic diagnosis potentially has treatment consequences because there is some evidence um, that um, Everolimus might be an appropriate treatment for epilepsy caused by mutations in this condition because stop gains in this gene eventually lead to hyperactivation of the protein complex, gate or one, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and eventually, sorry, not hyperactivation of this process, hyperactivation of the mTOR pathway, which can be reversed by Everolimus. It would have been nice, of course, if we could have made this diagnosis when he was 11 and maybe stopped him going through this entire process and uh, you know, leapfrogged him straight to effective precision treatment options. So I think this is really, again, an important outcome from the 100,000 Genomes Project um, with real treatment consequences for people with, uh, with difficult to treat epilepsies. Now I want to move on a little bit to some of the other findings from this um, and talk about a condition called Dravet syndrome. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the best understood of the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies. Um, it's characterized by a, a particular clinical picture. I don't think the details are important here, um, but this clinical picture, provided the information is available, can enable a genetic diagnosis to be made. So actually, with this clinical history, pediatric neurologists can make this diagnosis readily. Um, and in adult practice also, I think that diagnosis can be made, but in adult practice often people are not thinking about genetic epilepsies um, and in many cases in adult practice the early history is not available so people might be brought in from care homes to see us in clinic they're not able to tell us themselves what the what the early history was the carers known them for the you know the the, the duration of the journey to our center um, and so we don't get this history but there are some typical features like sensitivity fevers bringing on seizures and the important thing here from our perspective today is that most people who have this condition have loss of function variants in this gene, SCN1A. It's a rare condition, about one in 15,000 people, um, but it's an important condition for a number of reasons, because there are treatment implications once the diagnosis is made, because there is a significant risk of sudden death um, in the first uh, two decades of life, but also most people, of course, with this condition survive into adulthood. It's also important because there's a spectrum of phenotypic variation. So although the core phenotype is well defined, I see people with this condition who are still able to speak, who can have a, a basic conversation um, and who have lots of activities outside the home. Um, and, and, but on the other hand, I see people at the other end of the spectrum who have a really severe phenotype and are totally dependent for all activities of daily living um, and have no language, no communication and severe seizures. We don't understand why this is, um, but this is something I think that we're, uh, we're keen to explore from the genome perspective. So this is an example of why it's important to make this diagnosis. In this individual, and this is really this patient's notes spanning over as you can see, a few decades, his diagnosis could have been made at this point, had that diagnosis been uh, described at that stage more than 70 years ago, from this early history. He had a pertussis vaccination and three hours later, a generalized convulsion. And then the rest of the history is very typical. It's very unusual, of course, for us to have these very early records, but it's very important if it is available to, to be able to review this and to make the diagnosis because it has an impact on treatment. 
And that's because we understand something about the underlying pathophysiology. I'll just very quickly just go through this. There are basically two types of important neurons in the, in the brain. Of course, it's much, much more than that. But for our purposes here today, we have excitatory cells or pyramidal cells, inhibitory cells or bipolar cells. You need both of these to be functioning in balance in order to, to enable normal brain function to take place. You can study these in vitro. You can stimulate them and record the electrical activity. And what you see basically in Dravet syndrome is that for inhibitory interneurons, as you see here, whether you have two copies of the gene, one copy or no copies of the gene, um, the, uh, this is the excitatory neurons. I beg your pardon. The excitatory neurons work normally. They seem to be able to compensate for loss of this gene, SCN1A. Inhibitory neurons, on the other hand, suffer greatly. So if you've got two copies, they work normally. If you've got no copies, their function is greatly impaired. This is the basic underlying pathophysiology of Dravet syndrome. And the important thing here is that you can aggravate this excitation inhibition imbalance where excitation is preserved, but inhibition is impaired as a result of the genetic mutation. You can aggravate that imbalance by using the wrong drugs, by using drugs that block the sodium channel that the gene encodes. So here is another sort of case history of a person in whom the genetic diagnosis of Dravet syndrome wasn't made until they were 51. Of course, when they were born and when their condition started, the condition hadn't been described. So I don't think we can blame ourselves for not making the diagnosis at an earlier stage. But you can see that over those 50 years, he's had a wide range of different anti-epileptic drugs, all shown in these blue boxes. He's had uh, a range of investigations, none of which have come to a diagnosis. He's had a range of diagnoses, which in itself is, I think, very important and interesting. So the last diagnoses he had were generalized tonic-clonic seizures, spastic quadriplegia, and a severe intellectual disability, descriptive diagnoses. We only had records down to about here because all our records are now electronic and they don't go back earlier than that. So all we had to work on was this set of diagnoses, which could have described the patient I, I um, uh, went through before, who's got the KCNT1 encephalopathy. So this list of di this list of, 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 of features of this condition don't enable the diagnosis to be made. If you go back, you see the diagnosis has changed over time for no good reason whatsoever except fashion. And the earliest diagnosis he had, myoclonic epilepsy, is actually closest to what we consider to be happening in Dravet syndrome. Now, this diagnosis will enable us to make rational treatment changes, and hopefully improve seizure control. But again, you can see, we shouldn't really have to wait 50 years for this to happen, for him to acquire additional uh, problems as a result of his uncontrolled seizures. And in fact, what we see in adult practice actually is that we often don't make a genetic diagnosis because many of us, I think, are not really thinking about genetics. And I've only recently, uh, in the last 10 years or so, been thinking about it, but before that, uh, I too was of the view that actually it wouldn't make much of a difference, but actually it does make a difference. So in fact, in our cohort of 1,078 individuals um, who uh, have been um, sequenced in the 100,000 Genomes Project, eight have been identified, identified to have a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant in SCN1A, which gives them, in the context of their particular clinical history, a diagnosis of Dravet syndrome with its treatment implications. And for only seven of these, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, for only one of these individuals was that diagnosis potentially uh, something that could have been made from a review of the clinical notes available to us. In all the others, it wasn't from the clinical notes that were available to us. And when we went back and got all the pediatric notes, then it became apparent that this actually was a clinical and genetic diagnosis. But of course, in typical clinical practice in a busy clinic, you don't have time to retrieve those notes, to ask the GP for them, and to go through them in your clinic of 20 patients in a morning, for example. So here we see that the, the work from the 100,000 Genomes Project has really made a difference because it's identifying people who've got rare and potentially treatable genetic diagnoses associated with their, with their epilepsy. So I think for all these reasons, we do need to have a framework for how we go about looking at precision medicine. This is just a list of some of the ways that you can look, up, look at this. We need to identify what the underlying genetic cause is where we can, understand the pathophysiology and be clear that we are reversing that pathophysiology um, with the treatment that we think is a precision treatment. But the start of all of this, of course, is to, under, under, uh, is to identify the genetic diagnosis in the first place. 
One of the other things that we're looking at here is to think about why the phenotype is so different amongst different people with Dravet syndrome. So of course this can be extended to other rare genetic conditions. Um, we just happen to be particularly interested in, in this one uh, because of the wide phenotypic spectrum. One possibility of course is that there's, there's more going on than the single um, point mutation as it usually is in this condition. That there is for example variation in, in non-coding regions or in other regions of the genome or in other parts of SCN1A that might be influencing this. And so this is an early paper looking at this from Bobby Kerlman's group, looking at the, um, the effect of promoter variants on the severity of the phenotype. And they identified five um, haplotypes for uh, the promoter region and showed that all of the non-wild type haplotypes were associated with a reduction in SCN1A promoter haplotype activity, a promoter activity. So, of course, this is important because if we could um, raise um, the expression of SCN1A in this otherwise loss of function um, condition, then maybe we could uh, bring about some improvement in seizure control in people with this condition. And so this is something that, um, that we've been looking at in our group. This is the work of the, sorry, the acknowledgement has dropped off here, Susanna Pagny in my group and James Mills and others. And we've been looking to, uh, to uh, the distribution of these different haplotypes um, in uh, our group of people with SCN1A related epilepsies, have about 200 people with this, uh, in a group of people who've been sequenced in the 100,000 Genomes Project who do not have an SCN1A related epilepsy, and a group of unrelated um, uh, disease controls. And this, I think, uh, brings out another important aspect of, of, the, of the value of the 100,000 Genomes Project is that you can also create disease control groups where you know that people do not have, as far as we can tell, <clears throat> a variant in the gene of interest. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, uh, these are still early analyses, so I wouldn't pay too much attention, I think, here to the <clears throat> genetic findings. Sorry. Um, but this is, I think, one of the other ways that we are very interested to use the 100,000 Genomes Project data to see whether we can identify non-coding variation that might help us understand the phenotypic spectrum in these rare um, and serious epilepsies. And actually, you can then take this a step further, uh, and Mark was alluding to this earlier on, in terms of trying to quantify the phenotype in a more robust way. So this is work done by um, uh, uh, members of the team here, by Katrin silver um, looking at a way of quantifying brain excitability. So we do this using something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is a perturbational approach. Um, it's a bit like tapping the brain and seeing how, seeing how it responds. Um, and you do that using um, electrophysiology. So you can stimulate the brain. And in fact, what you can do is you can apply a stimulus and then you can apply a, a stimulus very soon after that. And that affects cerebral function in a particular way. This is done non-invasively using um, magnetic stimulation that crosses um, the skull and stimulates the neocortex. And that sends a volume of signals down into, for example, in this case, um, recording in, in a small muscle in the hand. Um, and basically what we're looking at here is um, a ratio that's derived from that paired pulse stimulation where you apply two pulses close together. Um, and what you can see here is that in normal individuals, this ratio is less than one. In people with barn door Dravet syndrome, the ratio is abnormal, it's greater than one. The ratio of the, uh, of the size of the second output compared to the size of the first output when you stimulate the brain very close together twice. But there's also a group of people who have um, variants in SCN1A that we expect to cause a loss of function Dravet-like phenotype, for example, a truncating variant here, um, or um, another variant here that, that should cause the same phenotype, but you can see the electrical phenotype is different. It's more like that of a healthy control, less like that of a person with, uh, with very typical Dravet syndrome. So we can begin to explore um, uh, the electrophysiological phenotype in vivo and relate this back to background genomic variation, other variation across the genome that might be influencing the phenotype beyond the SCN1A variant alone. And uh, I think this is important in terms of helping us to understand what's going on. So we've done this also using polygenic risk scores applied to um, individuals who've got these rare 
what we think of as monogenic epilepsies. Here, what we've looked at is a polygenic risk score for um, intelligence derived from a very large GWAS for this trait. And we've looked at this polygenic risk score in a group of people with epilepsy sequenced in the 100,000 Genomes Project who have epilepsy but don't have an SCM1A variant, compared that with a group of people who do have um, what we consider to be a pathogenic SCM1A variant, and uh, a group of disease controls, in this case, people with renal disease. Again, work from our group, from Helena Custodio and colleagues. And what we see here is that the polygenic risk score for, um, for cognitive performance here is significantly lower in people who've got SCM1A related epilepsies than it is in people who have epilepsy that's not due to SCM1A mutations and, uh, and people who don't have epilepsy at all. So in fact, although this, consider, this condition is considered to be a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, where the, um, the gene variant itself is causing both developmental problems and the epilepsy, and the epilepsy is then contributing further to developmental problems, actually we can see that those variants are acting against the background of um, a, a reduced polygenic risk score for cognitive function. So it's not just the SCM1A variant alone, the rest of the genome is also uh, um, having a role here. And this is important because we often think that by uh, treating the seizures alone, we will be able to rescue some of the phenotype. And of course, we must try to do that, but it may not always work because we can see that there is an impaired background. So if you look at our cohort of about a thousand or so patients altogether, what have we found when we've been looking back at the genetic diagnoses um, through the, the MDT process of establishing genetic diagnoses? Um, so there are, there are in fact about 1,200 patients um, that we're going to be looking at this for. We have interim analysis of about 320 individuals with epilepsy plus, that's epilepsy with a comorbidity. We have genetic diagnoses so far for 33, so that's about 10%. This is a group of people um, in whom uh, all the investigations so far have not identified a cause. And of course, I would also say, I think it's important to emphasize, this is the first pass. So this is with the first uh, panel analysis. We know that the data are going to be looked at again. We'll be looking at it in the research environment too. And I suspect that we will find many more genetic diagnoses as time goes on. But you can see at the moment that we have a, a range of genes that are, are most commonly affected. So DEPDC5, which we know is one of the most commonly uh, um, implicated genes in these epilepsies, SCN1A and a range of other genes. And in this interim analysis, it does seem as if impairment of uh, developmental milestones, intellectual disability, and normal imaging are factors which are more likely to be associated with the presence of an underlying genetic diagnosis. Um, and <clears throat> as uh, whole genome sequencing is obviously being rolled out now more through the NHS, we hope that this information, especially when we've completed it in the entire patient cohort, may um, help guide um, um, uh, the application of whole genome sequencing and decide uh, in which individuals it might be best to apply it first in order to come up with a genetic diagnosis. And I think certainly for adult neurologists and learning disability specialists who are involved uh, in looking after people with epilepsy, we hope that this will be useful information uh, for the use, the proper the best use of genomic sequencing. As we've discussed before, of course, there's a lot of other information available in the whole genome. Um, we've been looking at pharmacogenomic variants. Um, so for example, we've looked at HLA3101. Um, this is a variant that we know is associated with an increased risk of um, severe cutaneous adverse reactions on exposure to the sorts of treatments we use in epilepsy, aromatic anti-epileptic drugs and carbamazepine in particular. Actually, at the moment, the um, MHRA um, don't recommend genetic testing for 3101. Um, uh, but uh, if this information is known, then it is considered to be important to be uh, to consider it in drug choices. So um, we found 73 people um, in um, this group of people with epilepsy who have 3101. 71 of those have been exposed to aromatic drugs. Eight have developed a macular papillary eruption. One had a severe rash and a fever, and one had Stevens Johnson syndrome. And we're thinking now what the best way is to take this back. Um, uh, to um, our colleagues and, of course, to the people who, who carry these variants, um, because I think once this is known, it is important that we take um, notice of it. 
Uh, there were only two people with the B1502 variant, which of course, you know, uh, is um, testing is indicated in people of South Asian origin before exposure to aromatic anti-epileptic drugs. And one of these two individuals um, had already been treated with these and had developed a severe rash. So you can see there's a wide range of uses of the data emerging from the 100,000 Genomes Project in terms of causation, in terms of understanding um, the spectrum of disease, in terms of thinking about comorbidities, and here in terms of pharmacogenomics. And we're going to do all of this, um, uh, as Mark said, in the context of broader and deeper phenotyping of the people we see with epilepsy, um, characterizing the brain physiology using this, this is transcranial magnetic stimulation, stimulating the brain um, with um, uh, uh, magnetic impulses and then recording from um, a hand muscle or through 3D uh, stereophotogrammetry to pick up um, subtle changes in, uh, in facial anatomy. This is a paper recently published from our group from Simona Balestrini. Um, where we looked at how facial asymmetry, subtle changes in facial symmetry, not something that you could necessarily pick up, might relate to underlying um, brain uh, pathology. So I think I'll probably stop there because I think I'm probably running short of time. And uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your time. And thank you very much, Mark. I think you might be on mute, Mark. Yes, I am. Sorry, uh, Sanjay. Thank you for a tour de force. I mean, it's so encouraging to see what you've done with the 100k data. Uh, Esther has a question for you. Is there any therapeutic option to reduce the, the arrhythmogenic risk in Dravet syndrome? The arrhythmogenic risk? Yes. It's a very good question and, and I think this is um, still an area that I think is being explored. So um, we are always of course monitor the ECG but I think there's still some uncertainty about how much Dravé syndrome impacts on, um, on, on cardiac function, an area still, I think, for some research. Uh, but we tend to try to avoid, of course, agents that are going to aggravate um, uh, abnormalities that might be already present. And we also monitor the ECG where it's indicated where we found an abnormality. We'll, we'll look into that further and refer to our um, cardiology colleagues. So Sanjay, I don't have any other questions in the chat, but I just wanted to ask you something. In terms of the missing heritability, you indicated in, in some epilepsy plus patients, you did about a 10% diagnostic yield. What do you think is the likelihood that unmeasured structural variation, which we might see with long read genomes is responsible here, or even potentially other phenomena like epigenetics? I think all of those are likely to be contributing. Um, and I, coming back to the 10%, I, I, I think it's important to emphasize, I still think that is an underestimate of the yeah. true genetic um, causation there. I think the more we look, the more we will find, the more genes that are linked, the more that become green, the more we will find. But I do think the other things that you've mentioned are also going to be important. I entirely agree with you. And uh, thank you for all the uh, intensive work you and your team and the Epilepsy Society have enabled us to do for these people. We need to change those diagnostic policies. There's way too many of them, like your 51 year old in our program. Yep. So thank you for all the work you're doing. And um, I'm going to hand over in a moment to Professor Tim Hubbard briefly, but it remains for all the speakers today and to thank the team in the Genomics England Research team, that's Zan and Sam and the rest of the Genomics England Research team who support the researchers here. You for attending, I know how busy you are. And to thank you for your support over the past eight years, because we're going to take a break over the summer. And by the time you come back for your next seminar, I'll be gone. So uh, I thank you all for your support and hand over to my colleague, Tim. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, can you put the slide up, Sam? So this is one, more, one last thing. Um, of course, Mark is leaving, as he just said, and I think it's a good note to um, celebrate what's been achieved, what Mark has put in motion particularly for GSIP, but of course, across the whole project. Um, you know, I can remember dating back to 2014 at the Wellcome Trust when GSIP was launched. You know, there was a launch, but then there was a long period of um, negotiation about um, with all the different organizations around the terms. And of course, a long period of construction of a research environment and people getting used to using a research environment where you couldn't take the data home with you. Um, but research publications started coming in 2017, and now it's very healthy in terms of 
uh, the number of publications coming out of the project and the um, these seminars which demonstrate as well. So, you know, this vision of combining clinical care with research for everyone um, with a protocol that's a, approved for both, you know, that really was Mark's driving ambition at the beginning of all this. It's a very hard thing to execute. I think you could argue that nobody else has really managed to do it. You know, lots of people have cohorts where you get volunteers to sign up for things. This is about the whole health system. Um, so it's leaving a massive legacy. It's an exemplar for the whole UK health system and European health systems and beyond. You see now um, everything, COVID has been a great example for doing this, but it's built on the, uh, the developments um, in Genomics England for using health data for research in parallel of clinical care. Um, so if you do the ethics right, the engagement, transparency, you can take people with you. I think that's what's been demonstrated and Mark has been right driving that forward on all sides, engaging with all the actors. And I don't think we would have got there at all without you. So you now have thousands of people signed up to this consortium. Um, it's a vibrant entity with all the different domains. You can see the outputs coming. So we are gonna miss you, um, but I think you leave a fantastic legacy to science and the world. So well done, Mark. And you. you know, of course you're gonna become you're going to become your own domain pretty much, aren't you? So, uh, you know, <laughs> you just switch at the other side and become a researcher. Yeah, yeah. But um, basically, my mess final message to you all is get on with it. Find answers for patients. And if we get this right here, you've already raised 50 million. There's a, a giant coalition of researchers and someday all research will be done this way and indirect healthcare. So we won't have to wait between nine and 16 years for the benefits of your endeavour to translate into direct patient care. So I wish you every success in the future. Thank you very much, Tim. That was very kind. Well, well I didn't do it. Lots of people did it, and I'm just one person. But you led the way, and all the all the late nights negotiating with all the partners, there was an awful lot of that. There was. Um, <laughs> it's been a long, it's been many, many years. So yeah. um, thank you. Anyway, so maybe people can clap or unmute themselves or whatever you can do with this these strange um, systems <laughs> or stay silent <laughs> or stay silent okay thank you thanks, thanks very much i think now tim's finished it just remains to say goodbye to everybody and thank you so much for joining today and thank you tim and everybody and thanks to all the panelists. Bye. Yeah, well done, speakers, too. Yes, it's great. Great talks. Bye now. Bye.